We know the account of the children of Israel leaving Egypt and crossing over into the when they came upon the, the Red Sea. But there are some very interesting things. Here was a people who were in slavery, in bondage for 430 years, and now God says he has come down to deliver them. But as we look on the text and they are on their way out now, and we see where God said, verse 8 says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. Deliverance came, Sister Kathleen. Deliverance came. And what we see here, that which had the children of Israel in bondage wants to put them back in bondage again. Freedom came. Victory came. But the oppressor wants to put back the chains. Wants to put back uh, a lock and key on you again. And we find the same things happening today. We get a breakthrough. We get our deliverance. We get our healing. And we see the same thing coming back. Trying to entrap us again. It is not sufficient for us to be just celebrating the victory. But there is an element called maintenance that we must pay attention to. We must maintain the freedom that God has given unto us. Because the enemy is upset and mad that we are free. It's like you've gotten the, your break from, let us say, lying. The temptations to lie will be flooding us. The opportunities to lie will be almost daily. And as we look, we are, as we said, we know the account. Verse 10 tells us, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought out, out here to die? Now, one of the things I want to be very careful, the God that we serve, people of God, guess what happened? We must come to a place where we are, we are resolute in our belief in God. We must come to that place where we are not wavering. If God says he's doing this, it doesn't matter how what we see. Stand on the promises of God. What it is, uh, there was a pilot, there was a plane and they were about, they were, they were to crash. And there was a man of God on it. And he said, God, I know the pilot said we are going down. But you have made some promises to me that I have not yet seen fulfilled. That means I can't die now. Today is not the day in which I'm going to die because your words can't come to you. You're not a liar. Your words must come to pass. So however you are going to do it, God, do it. We have to stand firm. God says he has come to deliver you. And now you are seeing a mighty army 
600 chariots pursuing you. We, you are not, you're not warriors, you're not an army, you are mere just coming out of slavery. And the big bad wolf is coming. But what we have is what God said. What God says amounts to more than what the enemy is shouting and what the enemy is saying. The challenge that we have is sometimes because the enemy is shouting so loud, we allow it to drown out the words of God. But we have to hold on. If all we have is what God said, we have more than enough. Let me repeat that. If all we have is what God said, we have more than enough. Moses answered the people, verse 13, and said, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Moses had to have hope and believe in God when the others around him were fearful. People of God, God will bring you into a situation where everyone else around you is saying negative. Everyone else around you is backing down. Everyone else around you is running away. Everyone is crying and in fear and trembling. And you will have to stand firm. You, we, we, we can't afford to lose hope, especially when everyone else is losing hope. Sister Tasha did a song some time ago, The God is my firm foundation. When your foundation is solid, you, 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 you rest. And God is more than solid. Moses knew God. He had a relationship with God. And Moses knew that God would not disappoint him. We must come to that understanding and that belief, that persuasion that God will not disappoint me. Families can disappoint you, fail you, but God will not forsake you. The Egyptians were pursuing them. Moses, he said to him, let's jump down to verse 19. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind. The pillar of cloud to move from it in front and stood behind them. Verse 21. So what we are seeing now, let's, 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 we're getting to the message now. What we are seeing here is, let's picture it. There were two way routes that God could have carried the children of Israel. The easiest route would be through the land of the Philistines. It was short and it would have been an easier route. But God took them through the wilderness. And taking them in that route, they encountered the Red Sea. Why would God take you out of bondage to carry you to a road where there is an obstacle. There is a barrier. The Red Sea. We don't have canoes or boats to, 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 to ferry ourselves across. Yet God directed us into the challenge, into the barrier. What do we do when God takes us and around where we encounter barriers. We, we, we expect and we want it to be smooth sailing. You know, the plane is just cruising now. We're rich or cruising altitude. That's what we believe that we must get from God. But what do we do when God takes us to a place of challenges? God says, I've come to deliver 
deliver you and now he has delivered you and now you are experiencing barricades, barricades. We cannot move. And when you look behind you, you see the Egyptians coming. So you can't go forward because of the sea and you can't go backwards because of the enemy. This is where the word of God says, look up. Look up. Jesus now, God is our only hope. Many times in our lives, it's like we are facing a wall. We are trying. But we, we, are, we are hitting wall. We are hitting wall. Please permit me to share with you on the topic, the purposes of the Red Sea. Whatever your Red Sea, my Red Sea might be different from your Red Sea. I might not be able to handle your Red Sea. And you might not be able to handle my Red Sea. But the Red Sea is that which is standing between you and where God is taking you. The promised land. That is what your Red Sea is. Whatever that endurance is, whatever that barricade is. The first thing we see about the Red Sea is that it was a barrier. That's the first thing we see. The Red Sea was a barrier between them and their future. Them and the promise of God. The Red Sea was that endurance. But then the Lord spoke, so that's number one. The Red Sea was that endurance, a barrier, a challenge, a blockade. Then we see where God gave Moses an instruction and told him to stretch his rod. And when he did it, something happened. The sea parted. So what happened? God showed us something there. If all we see the Red Sea for is in its barrier stage. We missed it. We see it now as a barrier, but that state is temporary. Don't get frustrated now because you are seeing the barrier. Listen to the Lord and whatever the directions he gives, whatever directive he gives us, that we must do. Imagine God, you are looking at a, a, a body of water and God says, stretch your rod. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. There was, there was no record of this happening before. So there was no track record. There was no testimony of, yes, God did this before. Now all Moses had was to believe in the word of God. He had to have faith in God. When we face the barriers, the challenges, this is where our faith is needed even the more. Because the, the, the method of God sometimes is not so easy to understand. Stretch forth your rod, Moses. Stretch forth your rod. God will give, and so we can't also use, because God says stretch forth your rod here, every situation you find yourself in, you're going to stretch forth your rod. Every barrier you find, you're going to stretch forth your rod. No, God did not give a formula. What he gave was an instruction. And so for different situations, God will give different instructions. We remember when the children of Israel, they were come up at Jericho. The Lord didn't tell them to stretch forth their hand. He said, walk around and on the seventh day, he said, shout. Different formula. Different strategy rather. Where we have gone wrong, people of God, is this. Because God did it one way two years ago. When something similar happens now, we rather than going to God, we revert to what he had done two years ago. And when we don't see the result, then we question God. We are building formulas and God is building relationship. We have to run away from formulas. 
We can't put God in a box and say, God, this is how you must act. Moses stretched forth his hand and the water parted unto the left, unto the right and the dry land. Now, this is powerful because we are looking at first, we are looking at water not knowing that under the water there is dry land or from the water, move the water and there is dry land. It tells us that the situation, the state that we are looking at right now is not all that is possible. We, we are bombarded now because of what we are seeing now. But there are more to what we are seeing. What we are seeing now is not all that is available. You get this? Not what we are seeing, what we are seeing now is not that all that is available. There are more. The water was parted and dry land. So the second thing we see was that now, the, the, that which is a, which a barrier now becomes the highway. The passage. Notice, God did not reroute them. Right where the barrier was, God changed the state, changed the condition, and now right where the barrier was, it's now a highway, a passage. This is where they say God is a way maker. But let's take it a little bit beyond God is a way maker. And say God is the way revealer. God knew. God was not reacting. God was not, God, God did not go into, into, into deciding uh, mode because the children of Israel now had a situation. God is doing that, is the same for us. God is not God, God has not gone into a panic because we are in a panic. No matter how grave our situation is, it doesn't panic God. Can you imagine? We are having sleepless nights, headaches, pressure, pressure gone up, stress out. And God is not. Remember, they were traveling across, Jesus and his disciples, and the, 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 a storm came, and they cried out to him. He was asleep in the storm, in the, in the boat. Master, care us not that we perish. They were stressed, and Jesus was asleep. Jesus was not disturbed. So we come to that understanding that whenever we find ourselves getting stressed out, panicky, etc. Let's remember that God is not disturbed by this. So we now need to move out of ourselves and rush into God. This is not the time to be calling Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary, Sue. This is the time to call on God, the one who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise. Can I share something with you? Can I share something with you? Do you know that whatever the situation that we are dealing with now individually, God knew before that we were going to get into that situation. And God is an intentional God. <coughs> we're going to see that. So what what God did? God showed the Israelites, listen, by obedience, Moses obeyed my, my instruction and you see the state changed. And they crossed over. They went through on dry land. Imagine, think about that. Not even a little mud. 
was on their shoe. You know, sometimes you go through some things and there are evidences. Where was the evidence of the mud? They went through on dry land. There are times when God will take us through some things and it's going to be difficult to prove to persons that we went through it because the evidence is not there. This is where they say that I don't look like what I've been through. If persons knew the hell that some of us are going through in certain section departments in our life, they would say, but how, Sister Tasha, how are you going through this and you can come and, and you can sing and worship and how is it that you're always smiling? And, and but when you know the God that we serve, and know that, listen, I have no choice. There's no option. Anything outside of holding on to God is failure, is death. So we have to hold on to God. So they went through on dry land. And we declare today, so shall it be for us. Whatever the situation that we are facing right now, that we are dealing with right now, we are going to go through. Notice God didn't take them around. He carried them through. It means that we are not alone. We need to be very aware of that, that we are not alone. Tell the closest person to you, you are not alone. No matter how it seems, no matter how it seems, God is with you. There are many names as God revealed himself to the children of Israel. And one of the names that they categorized him was Jehovah Shammah. We need to remember that name. Jehovah Shammah. It means God is with us. Never leave us. He's there. Right where you're sitting, he's there. You went to buy and get something in the, the supermarket, he was with you. You're on the job, you're driving, he is with you. Not because we don't see him physically, means that he is not there with you. So they went across. And guess what? The enemy decided, this is exciting. They are going through. I'm going to do this also. You see how brazen the enemy is? A miracle is happening. And the enemy wants to come and capture you in the miracle. Don't miss that. So while you are, while we are rejoicing, the enemy wants to come out and interrupt the rejoicing. The victory celebration. It's how brazen the enemy is. But more than brazen, guess what happened? Guess what the Bible tells us, Josiah? The Bible says, and the Lord said, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. This was God's doing. Pharaoh was not acting upon his own accord. Though this is a hard teaching right here. Why? Because why would God harden the enemy's heart against us? Is it that God hates us? Is it that God wants our lives to be difficult? But God did tell us in the scripture. He says, I'm going to get glory on Pharaoh. What does this mean for us? Sister Open. It means it's not about you. Sister Opal soaking in that one. It's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. It's bigger than you. The crisis, the situation that we are going through is bigger than us. It's not God punishing us. It's not about punishing us or etc. etc. 
God is working on something that we can't even understand. It's a bigger, there's a bigger picture. When we look at ourselves, we are seeing the small picture. But what is the big picture in, of, the, of the story? What is the big picture of what's happening? In this case, the big picture was God is going to get the glory on Pharaoh. So when we sing the song, when we still sing the song, for your glory, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king. We will still sing that song. As a pastor by the name of Ron Carpenter, the Lord directed Sister Tasha to build a mega church. Huge. They got mortgage. And when they finished this stuff, you have paying off the mortgage. And he was like, oh, yes, Lord, thank you. Finally, we are out of debt. We own the building now. We own the property. The Lord spoke to him and said to him, turn over the church to such and such a pastor. He said, God, say yes. Your assignment is finished. Your assignment was to build the church. I didn't tell you you are going to stay there. That's your assignment, to build the church. Now, turn over everything to that pastor. And while he was there, meditating, thinking about this crazy instruction that God gave him, he heard the song, For your glory, <laughs> I will do anything. <laughs> He went to a concert and Tasha Cobbs was one of the, the, the singers. And when she came on, for your glory, <laughs> I will do anything. And said, okay, God. And he had to sign the documents over, turn over the church completely to the other pastor. And at the time when I was listening to this story, he did not know as yet what was in store for him, what it was that God was going to do next in his life. But now he needed to complete that part of turning over. It's a bigger picture. We, if, if all we can see is just ourselves, we are limited, we are, we are thinking too small. The life that we are living right now is not even for ourselves. If we are living for ourselves, we are failed, we are failed already. We are living for the next generations and the generations and the generations to come. Amen. Let's get back to the text. And so here we see now that the Israelites went through. And while they are going through their miracle, they are enjoying their miracle, the enemy is pursuing them into their miracle. And when they went across... So the first thing we saw was that the Red Sea was a barrier. The second thing we see is that the Red Sea was now a passage, a highway, their route of escape. The third thing we see now is that God said to, to, to Moses, stretch back your hand and bring back the water together. And Moses did it, and guess what happened? The waters came back together. 